the second Sunday before Advent, let me commend to you an ancient Celtic practice of uh, the 40 days of preparation uh, of Advent leading up to Christmas. Of course, we're familiar with the 40 days of Lent, which excludes the Sundays. This 40 days of preparation leading up to Christmas, beginning on the 15th of November, uh, includes the Sundays in its uh, counting and lead, takes us right up then to Christmas Eve. So uh, if you would like to do that, uh, I will be using some uh, contemplations and some thoughts and prayers from a little book which I'm showing you now. It's called uh, Celtic Advent by David Cole, who is the Deputy Guardian for the uh, uh, community of Aden and, uh, and Hilda, among other things. And uh, you may also like to... Uh, sign off the old church year by rereading Matthew's Gospel uh, and then looking into Mark's Gospel as the one which the new lectionary uh, leads us into in the, the new church year. Welcome to our service of morning prayer 2, beginning on page 101 for this, the second Sunday before Advent. Allow me to begin with a short sentence of scripture from our appointed Psalm, Psalm 90. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, which passes like a watch in the night. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, to pray that in the power of his Spirit, we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth will proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. We now come to our first canticle, the familiar Venite you can find on page 103, verses 1 to 7. O oh, come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, and he made it, his hands moulded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is the Lord our God. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. We turn to our Old Testament reading, which is from the uh, book of Zephaniah. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7, and then 
uh, 12 to 18. Be silent before the Sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated those he has invited. At that time I will search Jerusalem with the lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on its dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad, their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished, they will build houses but not live in them. They will plant vineyards but not drink the wine. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. Listen, the cry on the day of the Lord will be bitter, the shouting of the warrior there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. I will bring distress on the people, and they will walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust, and their entrails like filth. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. The fire of his jealousy, the whole world will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live in the earth. Now we turn to our appointed psalm, which is uh, Psalm 90. You can find it on page 697. And we read verses 1 to 8 and then also verse 12. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the earth and the, Lord, the world were formed, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, Turn back, O children of earth, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, which passes like a watch in the night. You sweep them away like a dream. They fade away suddenly like grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. But we consume away in your displeasure. We are afraid at your wrathful indignation. You have set out our misdeeds before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Now we turn to our second canticle, Jubilate, on page 104. Who shout to the Lord in triumph all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his face with songs of joy. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Come into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good, his loving mercy is for ever, his faithfulness throughout all generations. Now I turn to our New Testament reading, which is from Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. The man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. 
The master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. The master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents, for every one who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. come to that time of the year when we get some good news and some bad news, so to speak, from Scripture. We get the bad news of the uh, 
the settling of accounts at the end of time, from which the, the advent is also um, an aspect pointing us not just to the first coming of Jesus as a child unthreatening and charming in the uh, stable at Bethlehem, but also then as the judge of the whole world coming at some unspecified future time. We're very happy to welcome the young child, the incarnated God uh, in, in the stable, but the other message about a time uh, unspecified further in the future when we will have to account for our use of the talents. Now, this word talent is uh, is very technical in one sense uh, in the Bible. We're using certainly um, an analogy with money. Um, the talent, though, was not a coin. It was a weight. And therefore, its value obviously depended on whether the coinage involved was copper, gold, or silver. And at that time, the most common metal involved was silver. And the value of a talent of silver was considerable. Uh, well, again, researching this recently, I was amazed about the value uh, which was uh, assigned to it. It's worth about 15 years wages for a working man. Now, even if you assume perhaps a working man might earn at least £24,000 a year, in today's money, that's a mass of £360,000. This is a major asset and a major potential investment. So, uh, there can be no doubt that originally in this parable, the whole attention is riveted on the useless servant. And there can be little doubt that he stands for the scribes and the Pharisees for their attitude to the law and the truth of God. But again, any time Jesus is referring to scribes and Pharisees, his audience ought to be feeling uneasy uh, because we, like them, have a little bit of the scribe and the Pharisee about us. And the useless servant buried his talent in the ground in order that he might hand it back to his master exactly as it was. The whole aim of the scribes and Pharisees was, in their day, to keep the law exactly as it was. In their own phrase, they sought to build a fence around the law. Any change, any development, any alteration, anything new was to them anathema. And their method involved the paralysis of religious truth. And as we listen to that indictment of the Pharisees, we're thinking to ourselves, well, perhaps I need to uh, to be more adventurous in, in my attitudes to how we worship God or, or what God could do with me and my talents. And I'll come back to the definition of, of talents in, in church circles in a minute. So like the man with the talent, they desire to keep things exactly as they were, and it is for that that they are condemned. In this parable, Jesus tells us that there can be no religion without adventure, that's the key message from this passage this morning. No religion without adventure, and that God can find no use for the shut mind, for the narrow mind. Uh, but there's much more in this parable. Also, it tells us that God, of course, gives us differing gifts. One person might have received five talents, another two, and another one. It appears there are certainly different quantities, but it depends, again, on how they're deployed, whether or not that quantity is, uh, is brought to bear. It's not our talent which matters, our spiritual gift, as I will say in a minute or two. What matters is how we use it. And again, we human beings, as we know, are not equal in talent, but we can be equal in effort. Some people squander all the assets they have in a life which is maybe too uh, focused on, on pleasure, maybe too uh, focused on uh, ignoring the responsibilities that they should uh, grasp tells us that the reward of work well done is still more work to do. We notice that coming out of the passage, that those two servants who have done well are not told to go and lean and rest on their laurels because they have done well. They're given greater tasks and greater responsibilities in the work of the master, and that's how it works in the world. We, we know the saying, if you want something done, go to a busy person, and that is also how it works in God's world. It tells us that those who are punished are the people who will not try. The man or woman with the one talent did not lose his talent. They simply did nothing with it. So he lays down then a rule of life which is universally true. It tells us that to those who have, more will be given, and those who have not will lose even what they have. The meaning is, of course, that if we have a talent, 
and we exercise it, we are progressively able to do more with it. It's that, that idea of uh, use it or lose it. But if we have a talent and fail to exercise it, then we will, uh, in due course, lose it. And if we have some proficiency, even in human everyday practices, of some game or some art, and if we have some gift for doing something, the more we exercise that proficiency, that gift, the harder we work at it and the bigger the task, we will then be able to do as our proficiency levels rise. Well, if we fail to use it, though, we lose it. And we see that with those who maybe play golf or play the piano or sing or, well, uh, carve wood or, or think out ideas, uh, whatever their sphere of life. It's the lesson of life that the only way to keep a gift is to use it in the service of God and the service of our neighbours. And again, just before I close, uh, remind us all that we're talking essentially in a biblical context here about spiritual gifts. And I remember when I was in Holy Trinity, Woodburn County, Fergus, we did uh, a course called the Network Course with uh, another local church. Um, and it was all about the spiritual gifts. And I'll remind you of the, the list of gifts here in closing. Administration, apostleship, craftsmanship, creative communication, discernment, encouragement, evangelism, faith, giving, healing, helping, hospitality, intercession, interpretation, knowledge, leadership, mercy, miracles, prophecy, shepherding, teaching, tongues, wisdom. Well, I would like to think that is a comprehensive enough list for all of us to find at least one uh, and perhaps more gifts which we can develop. No one person will, uh, will have all those gifts, which is why we need to complement one another as we work to build and to establish his kingdom. Amen. Let us pray as we uh, continue. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, grant her government wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness, and let your servants shout for joy. O Lord, save your people, and bless those whom you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord and let your glory be over all the earth. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and renew us by your Holy Spirit. We come to our collects for this, the second Sunday before Advent. Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son was revealed to destroy the works of the devil, to make us the children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that we, having this hope, may purify ourselves even as he is pure, that when he shall appear in power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and ever-living God, we give you thanks for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger, and in all things guide us to know and do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go before us, Lord, in all our doings, with your most gracious favour, and further us with your continual help, that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name. Finally, by your mercy, attain everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Allow me in finishing to read some prayers on behalf of uh, uh, St. Hilda, whose day is celebrated in, in various churches uh, on the 17th of November, uh, just on Tuesday of this week. 
And Hilda, if you recall, was Hilda of Whitby. Uh, born in exile from her parents' native Northumbria, she returned there in AD 617, and that was a long, long time ago. And while still young, she and her uncle Edwin, who was the first Christian king of Northumbria, were baptised by Paulinus, a missionary sent from Rome. And it was the Celtic missionaries who shaped her, though, and with whom she worked closely all her life. She was initially made the abbess of the fledgling monastery at Hartlepool by St. Aidan. Here she was able to draw out the creative and spiritual gifts of people, which is why she fits so well into a sermon about the talents and to establish there an ordered framework within which they could flourish. So under her um, direction also, uh, she offered uh, where she was um, placed later in Whitby as a venue for a church council to try and resolve the differences between the Celtic and Roman adherents. It was that council in 664 that, um, well, the uh, dates of Easter and various other practices were regularized. So a great um, woman in the church, and one whom we should recall with gratitude. So some prayers. Blessed are you, God of the planet Earth. You have set our world like a radiant jewel in the heavens, filled it with activity, beauty, suffering, struggle, and hope. Blessed are you, God of this land, in all the peoples who live here, in all the lessons we have learned, in all that remains for us to do. Blessed are you because you need us, because you make us worthwhile, because you give us people to love and to and work to do, for your universe, your world, and for ourselves. Lord, help us to trade with the gifts you have given us. Bend our minds to holy learning that we may escape the fretting moth of littleness of mind that would wear out our souls. Brace our wills to actions that they may not be the spoils of weak desires. Drain our hearts and lips to song which gives courage to the soul. Being buffeted by trials, may we learn to laugh. Being reproved, may we give thanks. And having failed, may we determine to succeed. And our blessing, may wisdom, truth and fruitfulness abound in your life. May you always rejoice in the goodness of your Maker and go in peace with all people to serve Christ in one another. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. That idea of the Celtic uh, Advent preparation period of 40 days also has a, another interesting aspect to it. We talk about uh, two Advents, the Advent of Jesus as a child, uh, coming into the, the stable in Bethlehem and also coming as judge uh, a, at a later stage. The Celts also had the idea of a, of a third Advent, which is quite a, quite a nice one. fits in with the uh, Protestant idea of sanctification in that we have Christ coming daily into our lives, being present in all that we do. And it also fits in very well with this idea of uh, using our talents, our spiritual gifts in God's work. Let me finish with a prayer. Holy God, as I step into all that I have to do today, know the days which lie ahead. Remind me that you are there with me, that you desire to be a part of my everyday life. May I begin all things by focusing on you to set the ground. May I continue through all things focused on you, ensuring you are at the center of all I do. And may I end each task focused on you, knowing that I have completed it with you. Amen. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels guide Jesus
Spirit.